Our next guest, I am honored to invite her to the stage. She is a cyber policy consultant and researcher, and her work is focused on human rights, cybersecurity, and state interactions in cyberspace. So currently, she is a scholar at the King's Department of War Studies and a fellow at the Software Freedom Law Center. She's led initiatives through her work with institutions from the French American Foundation to Google, and she's joining us here today to talk about cyber war and cyber peace. So I ask that you join me in giving a very, very warm welcome to Ms. Camille Francois. Thanks, Holly. Is this working? Okay. Thanks for uh, taking the time and, and joining me here. I have to admit beforehand that sometimes I get nervous, and when that happens, I might switch to French. So if that happens, you know, don't stand there and do nothing. Like, just, just pause me. Like, give, give me a sign. We're, we're going to try to avoid that, though. Okay. So um, I've been working on cybersecurity, cyber war, and human rights for a couple of years now, and I've been doing this work with NGOs, universities, governments and some tech corporations. But what I'm going to present now is, is my work, so don't blame anyone else but me for it. The main idea that I want to chat with you about is the idea that cyber war is going to be the next frontier for digital rights. So we're going to talk a little bit about what this means and what, can, what we can do about it. First, I want to acknowledge beforehand that cyber war is a bit of a mysterious topic. My brother who's been listening to me talk about this for more than 10 years, still doesn't really understand what I do, and he calls me Professor um, Star Wars. So it's not that. There's really one reason that explains most of the mystery around cyber warfare, and it's not technical complexity. It's overclassification. Everyone and everyone who works in this domain acknowledges that cyber war-related concerns are very overclassified. As a matter of fact, the former director of the CIA and the NSA, Mike Hayden, recently admitted that everything that had to do with cyber warfare was, I quote, hideously overclassified. So I don't know how often he uses the word hideously, but I think it points to a strong consensus about the lack of transparency in these matters. So I was always told, if you want to navigate a tough, complicated topic, break it down into simple questions that you can work through. And I think for today, we're going to take four of them. The first one is cyber war, what is it? Then we're going to go, cyber war, is it new? And then cyber war, is it real? And finally, we're going to say, is it a problem? So let's start with cyber war, what is it? Ah, uh, it's not there yet. So cyber war, simply put, is when militaries around the world invest in cyber means to pursue their military objectives. It's when they start building malware to attack one another, for instance. It's different from cybersecurity. If you want to think about this way, cybersecurity can be society as a whole trying to protect itself from having crappy tech that people can poke holes into. That's cybersecurity. Cyber war is actually about how governments are looking for holes to poke into in order to maintain and establish military superiority. So if you think about it this way, there's actually a number of ways in which cyber war and cybersecurity are not good for one another. We can take a simple example. Say you're looking at a software that a lot of people are using, both your people and other nations' people are using the software, and you're contemplating a big vulnerability. It's a zero-day vulnerability in the software. Now, this is when a cybersecurity person says, OK, we found a hole. Other people can find a hole. What we need to do right now is fix this so that other people are not going to find it and exploit it. A cyber war person might say, actually, there's an exploit that I want to do with this that's going to advance one of my campaigns. So why don't we keep silent about it, hope no one else finds out, and let me do my thing? These are actual conversations that happen in governance. 
A fancy name that these sometimes have is vulnerability equity process, but fundamentally, these are the conversations that are happening in the cyber war world. So let's run with that definition. Let's move on to our next question, which is cyber war, is it new? It's really quite frequent to hear that cyber war is new, that it's the next hot thing that's coming. Um, but you know, it's been the next hot thing that's coming for like a good 30 years now. Here's two reasons why I think it's quite important to acknowledge that. First thing, insisting on the fact that something is really new prevents you from looking into its history. And there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from the history of cyber warfare. And it's a short history, it's 30 years, 40 years, but this is a lot of lessons and it's going to impact our world pretty heavily. The second thing is, when people heavily insist on the fact that something's really, really new, uh, it also has some element of like, oh, it's not a problem yet, right? We'll worry about it later. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. I want to say we're totally here. So we're not going to do like a history of cyber warfare, although it's actually much more fun than what it sounds like. Uh, but we're going to do like a super accelerated look at some points in time in cyber warfare. So when we talk about this, remember that there are four things that are mixed in it, right? There's the history of the theory, which is the first guy who said, oh, cyberspace is going to be a new battlefront. And I say the first guy who said, because sadly, in the history of cyber warfare, it's often guys. So I encourage you ladies to take it up as an area of inquiry, because it direly lacks women voices. So you know, the theory, the first guy who says, hey, you know, cyberspace is a new battlefront. Now, there's the history of the events, right? The big hacks, the big attacks. There's also the history of the debate, the public debate, when people start saying, oh, yeah, this is a concern. You know, we're worried about it. And finally, there's a history of the laws and the norms around it, the rule book, the framework. So let's go ahead and start literally 40 years ago. We're in 1976. Um, this is what some see as the first definition of information warfare. So information warfare is the ancestor of cyber warfare. It's also a discipline that changes the name quite often. So what do we see in this? Thomas Rona is a military contractor. He's an advisor for the DOD. It's a definition that had a lot of legs. It impacted greatly the way uh, not only the US military thought about information warfare. And if we read through it, right, it's the strategic operation and tactical level competitions across the spectrum of peace crisis, crisis escalation, war, war termination, reconstitution, restoration, waged between competitors, adversaries, or enemies using information means to achieve their objectives. Now, if you find that really clear, you're good. Because actually, it's not that clear. What's clear is the standpoint that I'd say cyber war is going to happen in this awkward gray zone between war and peace, in this awkward gray zone between allies and adversaries, and we're kind of going to maintain it there. From the very inception of it, you have a very ambiguous concept. In French, we have an expression that we owe to former president François Mitterrand that says, getting out of ambiguity is always at your own expenses. And military doctrine knows that. So later down the road, it's going to be necessary but very hard to get out of this ambiguity that we can observe 40, 40 years ago. Then what happens next? Fast forwarding, people get excited about cyber war very fast. Like it, it's catching as a meme, right? Um, do you guys recognize this? Anyone's familiar with this image? Yeah, I see some nods. OK, so this is War Games. Uh, this is 1983. It's actually a great movie. It's a science fiction and Cold War movie. So it's the story of like a very smart kid who's getting a bad grade at school. And there's this young woman that he wants to date. And also, his parents are giving him crap for the grade. And he's like, oh, I got a great idea. I'm going to hack into the school system. I'm going to change my grade. And everything's going to be fine. But of course, it doesn't go according to the plan. And he ends up hacking into a military network. And then he triggers a nuclear escalation with USSR. And then you know, he, he moves the entire country and the entire world closer to World War III. And it's a gigantic freak out. OK, why do we care? It's a fair question, given that you know, this is a Hollywood movie. Actually, 
that specific movie shaped U.S. policy quite a lot. In 1983, the president of the U.S. is Ronald Reagan. He's a former actor. He has strong ties to Hollywood. He cares a lot about what Hollywood has to say about the future of threats. And he's very impacted by the movie. He's hosting a private screening in his house at Camp David, and it triggers a whole cycle of politicians looking into this, and he's saying, OK, guys, you go figure out how close we are from this. And his advisors come back and they say, sir, it's actually kind of worse. Official freakout cycle. This is the beginning of NSA being put in charge of securing the nation's computer, for real. This is also the beginning of people having very, very harsh worries about hackers, right? Kids are going to take down the power grid. And so a couple years after that, in 1986, you see the first anti-hacking laws, right? The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act in the US. And if you're thinking, does it make any sense to have anti-hacking laws that are 30 years old and that were drafted after everyone panicked after a Hollywood movie? Then I think that the answer is in the question. So at this point, we're at the beginning of a cycle. There's a public debate about cyber war, and people start wondering, when is cyber war going to happen, right? In 1993, the military establishment starts saying, it's really going to happen soon. There's a very important 1993 report written by a guy named uh, John Orkilla and David Bronfeld that's titled, Cyber War is Coming, with an escalation, ex exclamation mark, and that's being sent to all the military apparatus. And so everyone is sort of like on the brink looking for the coming of cyber war. This is 1995. This is the cover of the Time magazine, right? Everyone's talking about it, but right now it's fairly theoretical, right? We know it might be coming, but we don't really, really know what it's going to look like. Martin Libicki, who's a fantastic scholar who's been working on cyber war for decades and decades, at this point in 1995 says, I'm going to tell you what cyber war is. It's a grab bag of futuristic scenario. And at this stage, it's kind of true. It's a mix of panic over the fact that people know how to get into computers and that we rely heavily on computers. The moment that's going to make it no longer a grab bag of futuristic scenario, but an actual strategic priority is going to happen in the late 2000s. And it's going to happen on both sides of the Atlantic. In Europe first, in 2007, Estonia is victim of a large-scale cyber attack, which appears to originate from Russia. The government servers, the bank servers, the newspaper servers are down. It's quite crippling for the country. And Estonia is a member of NATO, right? the organization of the North Atlantic Treaty. And as a member of NATO, they turned to the other members of NATO and they said, OK, guys, um, we have a collective defense agreement and we're under attack. We're under cyber attack. And together we have these norms, we have these rules that we created that say, when I'm under attack, you guys show up and you know, we defend ourselves. Right? That's what we all agreed to do in the case of an attack. And so everyone's like, well, it kind of makes sense, but we never actually defined cyber attack. So you look like you're kind of under attack, but we're not really sure because we never agreed on how our framework for how we relate to one another applies in the cyber domain. We're pl pretty, pretty clear about how this ties back to what happens in the physical world. But when it comes to the cyber world, what does constitute an attack? And what triggers this protection versus that protection? And so at this stage, they realize, a bunch of states realize, that really there's a need to clarify what states do to each other in the cyber domain and how we react to this. In 2008, there are new attacks against Georgia. And then soon after that, NATO starts working on clarifying these cyber norms. But it's a very slow exercise, and it's really done behind closed doors. In the US, in 2008, Classified U.S. military computer networks suffer a huge breach. It starts with an inflected flash drive inserted into a U.S. military laptop at a military base 
in the Middle East. The response to that incident, which is understand how this happened, remove the intruder from the networks, ensure it never happens again, is called Operation Buckshot Yankee. I really love the background music when I say Operation Buckshot Yankee. Operation Buckshot Yankee matters because this is what leads to the creation of the US Cyber Command. And US Cyber Command is basically the cyber war unit of the US military. So at this stage, we're at the end of 2008. We still don't know what cyber war is, but at least we know that we don't know, and we know that people have to come up with a better answer. We're not really talking about futuristic scenarios anymore because they're very visible precedents. They're public precedents, and they're precedents that look like it's done by a state actor, which is fancy talk for a government, against other state actors, and that is actually quite crippling. It can disrupt a country quite a bit, it has been proven, and since it doesn't look like people are going to get back and like, you know, ride on wax tables, it's going to look like the more we increase digital in society, the more cyber attacks will have the potential to be crippling. So as a result, at the end of the 2000s, everyone starts thinking about cyber defense. And at this stage, it sounds like a pretty logical reaction, right? Now, what's the problem with cyber defense? In cyberspace, it's very hard to draw the line between what is defense, what is offense, what is surveillance, and what is espionage. Um, put it differently, it's like the skills that you really want is the ability to penetrate your adversary's network. And once you're in it, you're a couple keystrokes away from an attack. You can also just be there and do collection, surveillance, and espionage. But this could also be a cyber defense operation. So everyone is building cyber defense capabilities, but really also what they're doing is building cyber offense capabilities. The more they say we're going to do this to ensure it does not happen to us, the more they're building the very same capabilities that led them to be able to do the same thing. For a long time, it remains an absolute taboo. People do not talk about cyber offense. They talk about cyber defense, they do cyber defense pack, they have cyber defense strategies, but they do not talk about cyber offense. Governments are just becoming to be a little bit more open about this. For instance, on the last United States military budget, you will find one line that says that it's funding directly cyber offense. That is, if you know how to read a US military budget, because it doesn't label it, but you know, it, it's, still, it's still out there. You, you can now prove that. So I want to highlight that once again. Everyone is building up their cyber capabilities, yet at this stage, we don't have a clue what the rule book is for cyber operations. We don't know what the law says about what governments can and cannot do in cyberspace. We don't know what the norms say about this. And to be honest, at this stage, we don't even have a theory for what we want in this regard. States are still debating among themselves. Maybe we should say, that's the type of things that we're OK, and that's the type of thing that we are going to consider as a cyber attack if you're going to do this to us. And maybe we should react like this or like that. But really, no certainty anywhere. That's a pretty bad scenario. And so at this stage, if you're thinking, you know, what might happen in a pretty bad scenario like that, what you're thinking is actually going to happen. And it's going to be called Stuxnet. And we're going to find out about it completely by chance. Stuxnet is a very big and significant moment in cyber warfare. It's also everything you fear about cyber war just came true. It's like powerful, well-resourced nations that are conflict in one another, secretly building powerful cyber weapons to target and destroy nuclear facilities. This is total nightmare scenario. Okay, so what's the actual story? In June 2010, 
There's a team of cybersecurity researchers in Belarus who discover a weird computer worm that is designed to attack industrial programmable logic controllers. They look at it and they're like, it's very sophisticated. It's kind of odd. We've never seen one of those before. No one else knows anything about it. And really, we're a little bit confused about what it's supposed to do. So they test it, and it appears that the worm does one thing. It targets the centrifuges in nuclear enrichment facilities, right? Concretely, that means in nuclear enrichment facilities, you have centrifuges that spin at a certain pace. It's very hard, it's very important, it's very controlled that the centrifuge keep the same pace. When you unleash Stuxnet in the program that runs this, the centrifuge go crazy and run at an increasingly high pace, and they blow up. Not only do they blow up, but the worm does something else. It tells the system that's monitoring the pace of the centrifuge that everything is A-OK, -okay, and that it's all good and pink and rosy out there. And so the researchers who found this by mistake in Belarus in 2010 look at it, and they're like, OK, that's a cyber weapon. And it's probably built by a state, at least. And it's also probably the first cyber weapon to do real-world damage. It does not erase your Facebook timeline. It blows up nuclear centrifuges. They also realize that it appears to target a specific nuclear enrichment facility, and one that is in the towns in Iran, and that it's also been spreading on a lot of other systems. Hasn't blown up other centrifuges, but you can find the worm on a lot of similar systems, and it replicates really fast. On June 2012, the New York Times explains that Stuxnet is actually part of a joint intelligence operation called Operation Olympic Games. That's the real name of Stuxnet. The other name is the name that the researcher gave the worm when they found it. It is indeed developed by at least both the US and Israel. And to this date, there's a lot of things that are still very unknown about Operation Olympic Games. People who have been involved in the effort of making Operation Olympic Games have expressed concerns like, we came so close to disaster, and we're still on the edge of it. We know that Operation Olympic Games is part of a bigger operation. We know that it did not really operate as planned, and that the different actors who were involved in de developing, deploying, and maintaining the cyber weapon all had different opinions about what the cyber weapon should do, and that there were several versions of it. That's pretty concerning. So what have we learned from Stuxnet? A couple of things, right? The first one is, if nations build cyber armies, they're probably going to use it and deploy cyber weapons. You don't build cyber armies to keep kids busy, and you don't build cyber armies only for cyber defense. That was really hopeful. The other thing is not having rules for how to deploy a cyber weapon is not just going to be a problem for cyberspace. It's going to be a problem for peace, security, and stability in the very real physical world, too. Another thing we're learning is that this war game idea that anyone could just like hack into a computer and make a cyber weapon because it's not like you know building a fighter jet. You just need a computer and the internet. It's actually not true. Those are extremely sophisticated operation. They don't happen by accident, and they're huge military maneuvers to make such things happen. So we're going to pause here on the train of the history of cyber warfare. Um, though, if you want to uh, check a little bit more about it, uh, there's a lot of things that are really fun that are happening after Stuxnet. I really like, for instance, the Sony hack, which is like a good demonstration of like freaking out in front of an attack and absolute confusion. 
Is it North Korea? Is it, you know, is it a weapon? Is it who do we send? The FBI, the CIA, the army all at the same time? Um, so, you know, more things happen later down the road that keep on proving the same hypothesis, which is we still haven't really defined what is or what is not cyber warfare. We still don't really have a clear rule book for how we react to it. And we're not really sure who's supposed to do what when something bad happens. Now, let's move on to our next question, which is cyber war. Is it real? Oh, I forgot that part. That's a fun one. Um, Fun question is, why are people constantly fighting about whether cyber warfare is real or not? There's two ways to look at it. It's true that so far, no act of cyber violence have triggered an armed conflict. Another way to say this is to say there was no cyber attack that was bad enough that it constituted an act of war. Though people are still fighting over where, whether Stuxnet could have met that definition, but the Iranian did not make that case. And so when people are saying cyber war is not taking place, an argument that goes in that sense is that all the cyber operations that are going on are actually not raised to the level of what we call war in the international system yet. This book, Thomas Ritt's book, makes the case that all these cyber operations are doing three things that are three classic military things. They're doing sabotage, espionage, and subversion. This is why people say cyber war is not there yet. And if you look at it this way, from a legal perspective, it's a good point. Now, another way to look at it is to look at capacities. And that is pretty real. Like, cyber warriors are pretty real. Last year, the Wall Street Journal did a survey of cyber armies. What they found, after noting that this was a very hard survey to make because of all the secrecy, is that 29 countries today have an offensive cyber unit. It either lives within the military or it lives within the intelligence. The biggest cyber units are US, Russia, China, Iran, Israel, and North Korea. I don't know why France didn't make that list. Too bad. They're also noting that there are another 50 countries that are buying hacking tools that provide them with offensive cyber capabilities. If you want to look up this hacking tool, some of them are from Hacking Team, FinFisher, Zerodium. There's an actual industry for providing states with offensive hacking tools. So the problem with cyber war, if you see it like this, it is becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's no clear definition, no clear rule book, and as everyone is building up their military defenses, they're also building up their military offenses, and as we know, this ends up by them using it. You might find people arguing that cyber war has not happened yet, what is very real, though, is the militarization of cyberspace. The militarization of cyberspace has been a strong and steady trend of how governments have viewed cyberspace for the past decades. And that brings us to our last question, which is, is cyber war a problem? So as we saw together, there's a lot of thinking about cyber war. Um, but there's something that did not get enough attention in this whole series of decades about cyber warfare, is how do you start with the other side of the coin, right? What is war in the cyber domain is a good question, but what is peace is the cyber domain is also a good place to start. The conclusion of our little journey is that the militarization of cyberspace has advanced much faster than our ability to build peace in cyberspace. So let me give you two examples. It's only in 2012 that the UN recognized that human rights who apply offline also apply online. 2012, the UN says, yeah, human rights, OK, you have them online too. And this is after a joint initiative from Brazil, the US, Nigeria, Sweden, Tunisia, and Turkey 
It's a good start, but there's a lot of meat to put on those bones. It's only a small little start. It's only in 2013 that a governmental group of experts at the UN recognizes that the international law, notably the UN Charter, or the rules that protect civilians in the face of a conflict, does apply to cyberspace. And it's the same story. It's, it's a good start, but there's a lot of work that's needed to flesh out what this means and how do you protect civilians in the face of a cyber conflict. This also shows that we don't have to start from scratch. We have rules for peace, we have standards for how governments should behave, we have fundamental freedom and fundamental right, and it would be good to map out how those apply in this context and how they shape how we want governments to be able to do things or not do things with their new and shiny and well-resourced cyber armies. This is an approach to peace that we call positive peace. It's not the absence of violence, but it's the construction of the mechanisms and of the rules that ensure freedom and stability. And I think this is where we should be aiming. So let me wrap it up and give it back to you for questions and discussions. What is cyber war? It's when governments leverage the cyber domain, our cyberspace, to establish and maintain military superiority. Is it new? No. Is it real? The militarization of cyberspace is very real. Is it a problem? Yeah. This is insta ins unstable, unsustainable, and dangerous. This is why we can no longer afford to keep state cyber power in the gray zone, surrounded by maximum secrecy. And this is why we need to build transparent and accountable mechanisms to ensure cyber peace. Now, thanks a lot for having me here today and for allowing me to share these thoughts with you. I would love to get questions and comments. All right. Thank you, Camille. We can move on to the center. Okay. I was Let's told it was going to be something with a, with a... Do you want to throw the talk box? Ah, okay. okay. <laughs> We've got questions oh, guys, already. Awesome. If, nice. anyone, if you're anything like me, your brain is like, I feel like I've learned so much today. I'm leaving here way smarter than I was when I came. Uh, we'll start down here, and you can toss it to the next person from there. Fun. Good toss. That worked well. <laughs> um, so, hey, Camille, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out in your definition what qualifies as cyber war. And so I'm very interested in when we see states very aggressively creating propaganda on social media. So every time I write about Bahrain, a state that is notorious for human rights violations, I get a whole wave of average normal Bahrainis telling me first of all that I should shut up because I know nothing about their country and second, that nothing ever wrong has ever happened there. Is this part of cyber war? If, if this is coming out from an official Bahrain government, is this cyber war? And second, in your spirit of positive peace, how should I be reacting to an attack like this? That's a great question, uh, and I love this topic. This is state propaganda. States have different ways to handle this. Um, in the US, for instance, the definition goes, when you speak to people that are not your people, it's not propaganda, it's public diplomacy. What you're not supposed to do is speak to your own people and tell them what to think. But if you're speaking on the internet, of course, you're doing both. And therefore, the line is grayer than gray, right? Um, the, Cyber war division that is concerned with propaganda is called PSYOPs. Um, the next worrisome trend in PSYOPs is when governments build this propaganda network not only to spread great things about their country, but to target and silence their critics. And this we're starting to see. And this seems like it would be a really good clear-cut case for something that is a clear violation of your right to freedom of expression. It's hard to demonstrate. We have a couple examples, some of them in Ecuador, some of them in China. But we're still fleshing out whether this practice is, is, is as common as it looks like it is, and what are the consequences for human rights. 
Thank you, great question. There was a hand that went up right behind you. We can toss it back after that one. Well, thanks. Uh, first off, great talk. Yeah. Thank you for that. I have a question. If you look back in history to, say, the invention of black powder or maybe controlled flight, are there similarities in, in uh, the development of warfare after those inventions, which we can project on, on cyber warfare? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's quite fun because when they start thinking about cyber warfare, they're like, you know, what are the strategic frameworks that we can look at? And so there's the entire part of the archives, which are people saying like, no, cyber is actually like poison because it's not coming with a signature. And so we're not, we're not allowing poison. And cyber is like poison, so it shouldn't be allowed yet. And others are saying, no, no, no. It's exactly like space warfare uh, because it happens in a civilian environment. Some others will argue, no, it's like nuclear warfare. And so because there's been this great mix of uh, bits and pieces of other doctrines, we do end up with quite a bit of a mushy grab bag scenario. Uh, but there's things we can learn from, you know, from, from kind of each of them. But there's no official, this is the type of warfare that it maps the closest to. Um, yeah. Okay. We can toss back to that. And I'm just curious, as, I'm, as we're thinking about these things, Camille, people like us, what can we do about it? Yeah. Uh, first, you can follow along. Uh, you can raise your voice against secrecy. Uh, you can say it matters. You can follow when the UN produces norms around cyber warfare, which really no one ever cares about. You can go to people who defend your digital rights and say, hey, you know, I think we should look into cyber warfare. And I think the next stage of that battle is really putting the issue on the spotlight, getting more information, lifting the veil of secrecy, and being able to have a well-informed public debate about what we want and don't want our governments to do with their military capabilities in cyberspace. Awesome. You see the box has made its way over here. All right. So you talked a lot about the militarization of um, cyberspace, but what about non-state actors as well? So one example that comes to mind is when Daesh um, hacked CENTCOM, whether they did it or not. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit more about just their capabilities and what we're sort of seeing in response to that? Yeah. So foreign terrorist organizations' cyber capabilities is a big question mark. Um, there's a lot of debate about it. So far, we believe that their capability is overblown. We don't think that they have the means, for instance, to take down critical infrastructure. There's a strategic component to it, which is if you are um, a foreign terrorist organization, cyber war is not technically your preferred way of action. It's very slow. Your operation can get caught at any moment. It's not doing this boom, dirty bombs that, that you're looking for as a foreign terrorist organization. So there are a couple of reasons to think that they're not as advanced as what people afraid that they would be. Though, we know that they are recruiting hackers. For instance, Daesh is recruiting hackers. And therefore, it's also a forcing factor for people to have a conversation around cyber warfare and the risk at scale. So it's a little bit both ends. OK. If any other questions around, then we're passing it up to the front. Hi. OK, I, I have a question about Stuxnet, going back to that. And um, I remember reading an article who knows where. And they said that, that uh, Stuxnet was undertaken without proper thought about what it meant for the future of cyber war and what it meant for um, you know, the consequences of something like it. Uh, can you comment on that? Yeah. Um, my best advice on this is in July, Alex Gibney is going to unveil his new documentary. It's going to be called Zero Days. It's going to be a lot about Stuxnet. It has great pieces of new information we did not have about Stuxnet. It looks like the story is there were a lot of cooks in the kitchen, and people had different intentions for what it should do or shouldn't do. And it looks like the story is one of the versions of Stuxnet did something that was not part of the plan and that did not have the approval of everyone who worked on it. I, I don't want. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want so, to do spoilers. So zero days. <laughs> zero days. In July. In July. I'll, I'll take it back up this way. We've got time for one more. I love it. Right back mm. over to you. Hi. Right, thanks for the talk. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what would be the the biggest uh, risk? Uh, what would be the most interesting point? Yeah, like points of interest for 
a cyber uh, attack like uh, infrastructure or uh, yeah, like a water installation or electrical installation and what would be the, the chance that something will happen in the next five years? So all targets depend on what you intend to do. If you want to take off someone, it's kind of good to hack in their car while they're driving. Most of today's car are very heavily automated, right? So for instance, they have uh, brakes that kind of do auto assist, right? So there's a lot of automation that you can break into, and most of the cars are actually connected. So if you want to just take down someone, you can hack in their car and send them off the highway, right? But if you're looking for absolute, you guys are looking at me like, this is awful. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> if you want massive, you know, massive, massive scale damage, then, you know, like power plant, critical infrastructure is, is a better target. Uh, but yeah, basically, if you look around you and then you look at which points of uh, your life touch the internet and you're the attack surface, the, yeah, the risk of something happening is uh, pretty, pretty wide. Hmm. Yeah. There, there's something that are more stable than what we think they are, right? So for instance, financial institution is a good one. People think that everyone's going to take down the financial institution, but no one has interest in taking down the financial institution. So while this has been the most like point of focus, it's actually more stable you know, in the long run and less likely to just collapse, because no one wants that. Thank you, Camille. Extremely <laughs> informative. And as I'm thinking ahead, I, I know I mentioned, how, what can we do? Um, what's a good starting point? I, I feel like with this, like, inf knowledge is power, specifically in this realm, what are some spaces you would recommend to go for people like us to gain access to these, these things? Um, I think we're still in need of a, of a one, you know, one, one place information point. Uh, that's something that hopefully would, would manage to build like a, you know, one organization that's dedicated to bring them this issue and that, are, that, it's, that it's bringing more info about it and that is seeking advocacy. But yeah, no, the sad answer is it's not there yet. It's, it's coming, determined. it's coming. In the meantime, <laughs> we can see zero days in July. Yeah, you and you can more. read about, you know, you can read about cyber warfare and talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very, very much, okay. Camille. One more Thank time you. for Camille Francois, please. Thank you guys. And in just 10 minutes, we'll have our next speaker coming to the stage. So thank you all for joining and sit tight if you're interested in sticking around for more. Thank you. I'll take that back. <laughs>